All right, we're continuing in the series, Defeating the Dark Side, Defeating the Dark Side. And uh, so far, we've covered a couple of topics. We looked at the first week of the series, Forbidden Fruit, and that was Genesis chapter 3. Second week, we looked at the armour of God, which was um, Ephesians 6. Today, we're looking at Satan's downfall, Satan's downfall. And uh, obviously, this is um, a topic you may not have heard much about the evil one, certainly not a, a message devoted to the evil one. But the thing is, the, we, we're doing battle and uh, we need to be educated. And the scriptures do have lots to tell us. Um, I'm gonna, today I'm going to unpack a little bit about Satan's history and about his future. We're going to look at Jesus' victory and the Christian's defence. Let's start with this verse here that talks about Jesus' own words, Luke 10, 17. It says, The 72 returned with joy. And said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Try and uh, cast your mind back to the context of that. Jesus has sent out 72 They're disciples. They've gone out as evangelists, 72 of them. They are preparing the way for Jesus. They're going into villages, into towns, and they're talking about the coming of the Son of God. They're talking about the kingdom of God is near. And what were they instructed to do? To heal the sick and to drive out demons. Preach the word, heal the sick, drive out demons. Three things. Um, The interesting thing is they came back, and perhaps what they were most surprised about was the fact the demons submitted to them. They commanded them to leave, and they did. Now, one of the reasons I would suggest they're surprised is because in the Old Testament, we see lots of prophets and preachers. In the Old Testament, we see lots of miracles. Even our last series, we looked at people being healed who were sick, raised from the dead, but we do not see demons being driven out. And one of the signs that God's kingdom has truly come, this evidence is now Jesus' followers have authority over demons. So this is significant, and it's why the disciples exclaim, wow, even the demons, they submit to us. We learn three things from that little passage. Satan used to be in heaven. Satan was cast out of heaven. And thirdly, The disciples have authority over him and his followers. Three important lessons. Now, like some other characters in the Bible, Satan has several titles. Let me read a portion of Revelation here, 12.7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael, that's the archangel, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Remember Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And there we see it further kind of described there in that passage. You notice Satan has several titles in that passage. He's referred to uh, as the dragon. He's referred to as the ancient snake as the devil, and of course, the word Satan as well. He has other titles too. One of the theologians I've read a bit of, and uh, certainly at uh, Bible College as well, is Michael Green. And he writes an excellent series of theological works. One of them is titled, I Believe in Satan's Downfall. Now, within that particular theological work, he, um, he goes into the fact that it is reasonable to suggest that in the book of Ezekiel and Isaiah, we have some further information about Satan's downfall. Um, If you were looking at the book of Ezekiel, it'll talk about the king of Tyre and the prince of Tyre for over a few chapters. Tyre was an island kingdom, very decadent, very sinful. And the prince over that kingdom and the king over that kingdom, I believe, are referring to completely different people. Talks a lot about the king, who is clearly human, Uh, sorry, the prince who is clearly human, then it moves across to talk about the king. And as Green would suggest, there's every evidence, this king, it's clearly clearly the king is not human. Every evidence is referring to Satan himself. Let's read a little bit. So number one, Satan's history. We're looking at that now, Satan's history. Ezekiel 28.11, it says this. 
The word of the Lord came to me, writes Ezekiel, son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre. We've moved from the prince now to the king, the king of Tyre. Say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Notice that. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Cornelian, chrysolite, emerald, topaz, onyx, jasper, lapis, lazuli, turquoise and beryl. Your settings and mounts were made of gold. On the day you were created, notice that, not born, created. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as guardian cherub. Guardian cherub, so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. Holy mount of God refers to heaven. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth and made a spectacle of you before kings. Notice some of the things within the description. The creature's clearly intelligent and the creature is beautiful, ordained with, or, 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 uh, or uh, has precious stones all over it as well. Now, remember, at one point it was in the Garden of Eden. Remember in the first week in the series, we talked about the original word that's been translated serpent, the word nashash. And I quoted to you from uh, one of the, the scholars who writes an excellent work, the Genesis record, Henry Morris. And he says this, nashash, some maintain, originally meant shining, upright creature. Very different to snake, isn't it? And this guardian cherub may well have been that creature, whether it possessed or influenced the creature in the garden or was it the creature in the garden? It's not completely clear. I've already said the creature is created, not born. It's clearly not referring to a human prince. Its heart became proud because of its beauty and it was thrown out of heaven. Like I said, theologians, many of them believe this is actually referring to Satan. It's one of his other titles, his early title the guardian cherub. Let me read Jesus' words again. Luke 10, 18. It says, He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In each of these passages I've dealt with so far is this falling, this casting out of the mount of God or of heaven. Let me look at another one. Isaiah 14, 12. In the New King James Version, it's titled The Fall of Lucifer. It says this, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Notice that. Yet you will be brought down to Sheol, which is another word for Hades, to the lowest depths of the pit. Now, Lucifer literally means bearer of light or morning star. So sometimes the NIV will translate it morning star instead of Lucifer. I think Lucifer is better because it's a title, like a name. One of the conservative theologians, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was a Welsh Congregationalist, a Methodist minister, wrote many great theological works, probably most famous for being the minister of Westminster Chapel in London. So a very respected man. He writes a book titled The Christian Warfare, where he speaks of these two passages I've just read today. And he says this, These descriptions, although primarily perhaps meant to apply to Tyre and Babylon, are generally agreed to have a much wider meaning. Tyre and Babylon are not merely earthly powers that are opposed to God. They are also symbols, as it were, of the power of the devil and his forces. I agree with him. 
Michael Green, the theologian, points out that this is certainly no new theology. The early church fathers, that's those who were the theologians of the first and second century. We still have some of their works. They generally believe that those two passages refer to the fall of Satan. For instance, Green quotes uh, Tertullian for specifically. Tertullian believed that Jesus' words about Satan's fall directly related to Isaiah 14, 12. Remember Jesus' words, I saw Satan fall like lightning? One of the church fathers says specifically that relates to Satan as recorded in Isaiah. So here we're not dealing with weird, wacky, new theology. This has been mainstream theology in the Christian church for a long time. But it helps us fill in the picture of who Satan was. And if you understand something of Satan, something of his history, it helps us do battle against him. Let's think of Satan's future. Number two, Satan's future. I'm going to look to the book of Revelation 20, verse 3, 20 in the first three verses. It says this, John, the apostle writing, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who was the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore. That is the future of Satan. He will ultimately be bound and rendered powerless. He will not be able to influence the nations anymore. And of course, that's not just Satan. It's his fallen angels. It's it's the demonic world as well. Let me read a few verses here. The future of the fallen angels, Matthew 25, 41, Jesus' words. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal flame, prepared for the devil and his angels. Or in Jude 1, 6, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, meaning heaven, but left their own abode, he, that's God, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. 2 Peter 2.4, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. That's the future. We know that the evil one and his followers are all defeated. Let's look for a moment at Jesus' victory. Why do we have victory today? Well, it's because of Jesus. John 12, 28, Jesus' own words. Father, glorify your name. John 12, 28. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now, notice this. Now the time for judgment on this world, now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. You've got the idea? Jesus here is referring to his his, um, crucifixion, the ultimate resurrection, of course, too. But when he is lifted up, I will draw all peoples to myself. People will come to believe in me from all over the world. And he mentions there, because of that, the, the prince of this world will be driven out. The prince of this world refers, of course, to Satan. Hebrews 2.14 says this, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives have been held in slavery by the fear of death. How is the devil's power broken? By Jesus' work on the cross. So we've learnt. Satan's defeated by the work on the cross and Satan's future imprisonment will render him completely powerless. But today we are still in a battle. The battle still continues today. What does that mean? Well, friends, I'm going to be frank. Satan and his hordes of fallen angels and demons are trying 
to deceive people. Remember, that was one of the phrases used of Satan, who deceives the whole world. That's a description of what he does. Alongside his demons and fallen angels, believe me, there is spiritual attack all over this world. And that's the battle we're in. It's subtle. And because of that, so many people are not aware of it. And of course, it doesn't get preached on very much, even though the scriptures are literally full of it. Let me talk about how early that battle begins. You might think uh, the devil doesn't bother with little children. Oh, his, his demons, his fallen angels, they are after little kids like you wouldn't believe. When I was four or five years old, I didn't grow up in a church background. My background's a little bit rough. And believe me, at that age, I could swear like a trooper. Something went wrong. I can't even remember the incident now. Now, I knew something of God, like so many Westerners do. My parents weren't churchgoers, but I kind of had a concept that God was out there. Something had gone wrong that I was very angry about, and I had a real temper on me. And so I expressed my anger to God. Yelling my head off, swearing, cursing God because things didn't go right. Did that for whatever, you know, for a while, seven minutes, eight minutes, something like that. I'm carrying on. Naughty little fellow, wasn't I? Well, as I'm doing that, I felt a presence come alongside me. And these words, well, what about me? Well, what about me? No, I'm convinced that would have been one of Satan's servants. Sees a little kid cursing God and wants to recruit them at that age. That's how he's there. Now, it freaked me out, so it was a good thing. It freaked me out, and I realized what I was doing was obviously pretty bad. I better stop that. <laughs> um, believe me, I wasn't drawn to it. It's creepy as, you know. Um, but it just reminds us this is how active the fallen angels and demons are. When I was 21, I was searching for God. Um, I had uh, been given a little Red Gideon's Bible in year seven, which I'd kept purely by, God, by, by um, God's providence, what I would have considered coincidence. I happened to start listening to the radio fairly late. It was one of my music channels. And they're late at night, secular radio. They had Chuck Swindle on preaching. And I started listening to it. I thought, oh, this guy makes a lot of sense. And so that's when I dug out that little Gideon's Bible and I started to read it, started to listen to this guy's preaching. I recorded a few of the sermons. I thought, oh, these are really good. It got me searching, got me reading the Bible, got me seeking God. And so I was doing that for, you know, quite a few weeks. And as I started doing that, I was getting nightmares, really vivid, scary nightmares. And um, I remember one particular Saturday, wasn't working that Saturday, so I thought, well, I'm going to spend some extended time trying to connect with God. So I listened to four of Chuck Swindle's sermons that day. Um, I read a lot of scripture and intermittently throughout the day I had moments of prayer. I didn't know the way to salvation at this point. I'm just trying to connect with God. And I thought, well, that, that should settle these nightmares down. Well, that night, I had the worst, most vivid one I'd ever had. And the tail end of that dream, I, I was in an apartment and um, there was a dressing table kind of at the wall across from the bed. In the dream, I dreamt that there were three statues on the dressing table. In the dream, they came alive. And the middle one, I dreamt, was Satan himself. And I woke up with a start and believe me, the sense of fear in the room was Huge. It was like tangible, terrifying. And I was so confused. And, and I'm, I'm saying something like this to God. I'm saying, God, I don't understand. I don't understand. You know, yesterday I spent all that time listening to sermons, reading the Bible and praying, and the things are not getting better. They're getting worse. They're getting worse. This is the most, you know, and I'm, I'm scared. I'm freaking out. I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. I wouldn't have used the term Holy Spirit, but I felt God speak to me and said this, 
still distinctly remember the words. Not all, not audio, audible, uh, not audio, but could hear it very strongly in my heart and mind. These words. The reason this is happening to you is because there's someone who does not want you to get to know me. Shall I say it again? The reason this is happening to you is because there is someone who does not want you to get to know me. Now, I'll tell you what, when it happened, I mean, it was like revelation. It was like a, the lights came on because I knew nothing of spiritual warfare. I didn't understand that whole concept. But the first time I understood it, oh, my goodness, there's a battle going on. There's a battle. The, 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 ev- the, the evil one, the, the Satan, as I saw in the dream, he's trying to confuse me, trying to keep my soul. That's how real this is, friends. Well, by the grace of God, a few months later, I committed my life to Christ. Number four, the Christian's defence. Number four, the Christian's defence. How do we battle against Satan? Satan's hordes, Satan's demons, Satan's fallen angels. How do we battle against them? Well, last week, of course, we looked at the armour of God and there's still some of those available if you want to take one of the ways. That is a great way to battle. But let me look at a different passage today. Revelation 12.10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Three things. Three things there, friends. Three weapons. Three weapons. One, the blood of Jesus. Two, the word of their testimony, it says. And three, not shrinking from death. Let me briefly comment on each of those. Firstly, the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. Jesus' death on the cross and his shed blood. Revelation says this, 1.5. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us. Remember that. He loves us and has freed us from our sins by what? By his blood. And has made us to be a kingdom of priests, to serve God the Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. We're saved. The evil one is defeated by the blood of Jesus applied to our life, by his work on the cross. And why? Well, we're called to be priests, to serve the Almighty God. The second thing that's mentioned is the word of testimony. Let me um, you just pause for a moment there to think about how real that is and say the Apostle Paul's life. You think in the book of Acts, twice we have a detailed version of his testimony, his story of coming to faith in the one true God, or the almighty Jesus Christ. And he, he testifies. He shares that. Um, and clearly, it was a regular part of what he did, the word of his testimony. Now, the apostle Peter encourages all of us to do that. Look at this. 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. What's Peter saying? He's saying be someone who testifies to the reality of Jesus Christ. Now you might think, but but how does that make me stronger? Well, clearly it does. How did they defeat Satan? By the word of their testimony. Now, not only the blood of Jesus, but the word of their testimony. The fact that they would proclaim, the fact that they would speak out the reality of Jesus in their life. It's a powerful tool, friends. Now, if you're not sure about that, let's have a look at this navigator's wheel. You remember um, uh, the beginning of this year, we did a series called Growing in Christ. And the booklet that everyone was doing was associated with the organisation that put this out. What does, it call the, what does it say about the obedient Christian in action? It says they're going to have four things in their life. They're going to have prayer, they're going to have fellowship, they're going to have the Word of God, and what's the next one? Witnessing. 
witnessing. They're going to be people who share their testimony, to share the reality of Jesus. It makes you strong. It makes you strong. That's the reality. One more thing. They didn't shrink from death. Notice that? Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Paul writes, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Now, we know that scripture well. It's a famous one. And we say it and it sounds poetic, but Paul meant it. Paul meant it. He was beheaded for his faith in Jesus. Peter, of course, he died crucified upside down. These guys really meant this stuff. They really did believe I'm crucified with Christ. My life is important, but my life is surrendered to the one true God. His purposes are my priority. Now, I know you might think, yeah, but we're not living in the first century now, Lee. No one's lives are going to be in danger. I was at a Baptist um, event just recently called Nourish. They have this uh, every year where pastors gather together and uh, listen to some preaching. Um, Well, um, you remember Jason who used to lead worship here a lot? He's at Kerrang Baptist. His pastor was speaking. He's Pastor Fred. He's an African. And um, Pastor Fred, uh, who is ministered in, was ministering at the time of this story in Nairobi. Now, Nairobi's strongly Christian, but it also has pockets where Islam is strong as well. His church was in an area where Islam was strong. And he told us all the story of uh, where he got word that there were hundreds of Muslims were coming to his church and not for salvation. And so quick, they didn't have time to leave. They quickly locked up the church building and their offices and... Um, about 500 Muslims came over the hill. They tried to smash in the doors, smash the windows, set the building alight. He had a a nice land cruiser, burnt it to a crisp. And as Fred, Pastor Fred, Jason's pastor, told the story, you could see this this is still a vivid memory for him. This is challenging stuff. Their lives were seriously in danger. But Fred's first commitment was to serve Christ no matter where that might be. Now, by the grace of God, no one was killed. The Muslims didn't manage to get into the church. Now, of course, they called the police. The police were scared. They weren't going to intervene. They'd just get killed as well. So there's nothing they could do other than really pray, and that's what they did. And by the grace of God, they were protected. But this is real, friends. This is Jason's pastor telling the story just a couple of weeks ago. Now, Derek Prince, who is probably one of the greatest authorities when it comes to spiritual warfare and these sort of topics, the late Derek Prince states this. He states that the Christian that is even willing to give up their life for Jesus, that's the person Satan fears the most. He says it like this. Who does Satan fear the most? Who does Satan fear the most? The Christian who's willing to surrender all, to give up even their life for Christ. That is who Satan fears the most. Let me um, draw the message to a conclusion. I'll tell you a tail end of the story of John Ramirez. Let's put up um, the image here of John Ramirez for a moment. Take a picture of that if you like. This guy has really got some great material. If we're looking at the spiritual warfare thing that we're doing at the moment, he is a great guy to have a listen to. Take a pic, get his name spelling right. Uh, But all you have to do is punch in his name. It'll come up with his various sermons. Let me tell a little bit of his story. It's the tail end of it. John, um, to give you the background first, he was someone who uh, gave his life to Satan when he was eight years old, went through the whole ceremonies and stuff. His dad was a warlock. Now, he was very high up. He served Satan for about 25 years and um, was one of the most senior of the warlocks in New York, third from the top. Enormous powers. People were terrified of him. Well, to cut a long story short, after about 25 years of serving Satan, and when he did something wrong, Satan blinded him for a year, he was starting to get a little bit disillusioned. When I say did something wrong, wrong in Satan's eyes, 
didn't obey Satan completely about something. He, in this period of his life, did have some questions. And there were circumstances that led him to those questions. One night, he's, he's in his apartment just watching the telly and a voice, I think it was audible, I think he said, a voice said, I'm coming soon. He knew the voices of various demons. He knew the voice of Satan. He knew this was none of them. It was Jesus speaking to him. And in the thick of this, Jesus started to reach out to him. At one point he said, look, I want nothing to do with you. I know the Christian religion is weak. I know Satan is the powerful one. I don't want anything to do with Christianity. I don't want anything to do with you, Jesus. Well, he eventually said, if you really are the all-powerful one, then you prove it. You prove it. You prove it. That night, John Ramirez, he believes it wasn't just a dream. He, believed, he believes his spirit actually left his body. Briefly speaking, he was into astral travelling. He knew how to allow his, body, his spirit to leave his body anyway. He found himself that night in hell. And there in hell, horrible environment, as you can imagine, Satan appeared to him and said to him basically this, you have betrayed me. I have given you the arts. I have given you powers. And now you betray me. And at that point, Satan lunged at him as to kill him. Ramirez said, the cross of Jesus Christ appeared. I'm talking in hell. The cross of Jesus Christ appeared. And he said, that Satan became a blubbing mess like a child that had been spanked, cowering, cowering before the cross of Jesus. Ramirez's spirit returned to his body. He got out of bed and he resolved, I will follow Jesus the rest of my life. I have been lied to. It is not Satan who has all power. It is Jesus. And for the last couple of decades, he's been serving the Lord. He was discipled by uh, John Wilkinson, quite a, uh, you know, quite a well-known, strong Christian leader. And he's had an active ministry now for over two decades, speaking all over America, tremendous messages. Great evangelist, actually. Let me finish with this passage which reminds us as to why any one of us should indeed respect, revere before the Lord Jesus. We're used to him reading about him in the Gospels, I know. And they're beautiful images. I love the Gospels. But here I'm going to read about Jesus in all of his splendor as the King of Kings. Let me read it. Revelation 1.12. John writing, and John was Jesus' closest friend on planet Earth. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone who looked like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His hair on his head was white like wool. As his right hand held seven stars. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. I'm not surprised. Then, Jesus, then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever and I hold the keys to death and Hades. Well, friends, on that note, let me call Brother Tom to come and pray for us. Come and pray for us, brother. Hallelujah. Tom's last prayer in our church. Hey, this is a significant moment. Hallelujah. Father God, you have called us into your great salvation. You've given us hope. You've given us forgiveness. You've given us a spirit. 
that makes us work in this world never to be afraid. Lord, we want to pray for every member of North Church and even those who are anticipating of becoming members as they listen to your word online. Here in Epping, in Melbourne, in Craigieburn, wherever they are, Lord, we pray that you open their eyes. Help us to be bold because of the spirit that is in us. The spirit that says, Jesus is Lord. The spirit that says, Satan, you are defeated. Help us, O oh Lord, to bear your testimony daily, wherever we find ourselves, at home, at work, at school, in the open fields. We pray your hand upon every one of us, the leadership of this church, and that you will make us shine for you in this dark world. We are blessed to be called your children. Help us live like your children daily. For in Jesus' name and by his grace, we ask all these things. Amen.